Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium in the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We're glad to see a number of visitors. We appreciate you being here. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. And this is Preacher Edward speaking. Now, I'll take your Bible today and turn, will you please, to two places in the Old Testament. I'm reading, first of all, from 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1, I'll give you the page number so you can turn there, page 319. And then Genesis chapter 30. You turn there in the Word of God and follow me as we read the Scriptures. I'm going to speak today on this subject, give us children or we die. Give us children or we die. And this message today and singing and music will be on tape number 314. Tape number 314, if you'd like to have the tape, you write in and get it for a gift of $3. And the $3 is used to help defray our real expense. If you're not getting our daily broadcast, then you tune to the station where you're now listening, and you can get the daily broadcast each day at 12 o'clock noon, Monday through Saturday. That's in on WNGC, 95.5 on your FM dial, the big giant station in Athens, Georgia. I appreciate you tuning in. Now, this is a faith ministry. I can only stay on the air as you that love God keep me on the air. And you see the need and value of this great ministry. I was talking to a man the other day, and he looked to be about my age. He said, Preach Edwards, I listened to you when I was 15 years old. Well, I got to thinking about it. Well, uh, I've been on the air now in my 40 year. He may have missed it some, but I've uh, been on the air a long time. In my 40th year, broadcasting the gospel from the classic city of Athens, Georgia, and people that love God and people that can see the need and the value of the ministry has kept us on the air. Otherwise, I could not have stayed on the air. God put us on. God spoke to the hearts of his children that love him. Help me stay on. And eternity alone revealed the good that's been done through this ministry in the past 40 years. And the blessings is now out in the radio listen audience in homes all over the Georgia and South Carolina and North Carolina, even in uh, parts of Tennessee and various other places where they get the gospel message and they enjoy it. So you make that possible. I want you to pray for me and write to me. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. If you'd like to have the nice charts, it's been put out by a couple of our Bible teachers here at Northside, Brother Lewis, Brother Getty. You can have them at your request. All you got to do is when you write to me, just say, Preach Edwards, or uh, have these charts sent to me. And you'd enjoy the good Bible study from the charts, and they can be helpful. And these good men will get them ready in the mail to you. No charge to you because they want to get out the gospel. Now in 1 Samuel chapter 1, page 319, Now there was a certain man of Rapathaim Zophim, of Mount Ephraim, and his name was el Kenai, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephrathite. And he had two wives, and named the one was Hanner, and the name the other, Pitaniah. And Pitaniah had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city, yearly to worship and to sacrifice in the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Pitaniah his wife and all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore, 
for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, he provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? Why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli, the priest, sat up on a seat by the post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in the bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt look indeed on the affliction of thy handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thy handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man-child, that I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. That's reading from the first chapter of 1 Samuels, verses 1 through 11. Now I want you to turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 30. It's page 44 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. It says in verse 1, reading only one verse, And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. Give me children or else I die. Now in those days, motherhood was looked upon as the highest function of a wife. If she had no children, she was ashamed, she was embarrassed, she felt like maybe a husband, many times a husband didn't love her like he should. And, and when she saw the women giving birth to children to their husband, then they were greatly grieved in those days. And they spent much time in prayer. That was Hannah's problem. She had no children. And the other wife or husband had children. But she had none, and he loved her very much. And she wept, and she called on God. She wanted children. And we find the same case here with Rachel. Now we find that Jacob's other wives had children, his other wife, Leah, but uh, Rachel had no children. And it broke her heart, and she was deeply concerned about it. And she went to Jacob, her husband. And, he, and she said to him, give me children or I die. If I don't have some children, I'm going to die just as soon be dead as it, living if I don't have any children. I want children. Because Jacob said to her, said, who you think I am? I'm not God. It's up to God as to whether or not you have children. Now I'm going to apply this today from a spiritual viewpoint in regard to our churches today. And that is we need children, I'm talking about spiritual children, born into God's family, into our churches. And as we take a look at what happened here, and do accordingly from a spiritual viewpoint, I believe we can see children born in our churches. Now we need to pray God give us children, we must have children. If We must die to have children, and we will die if we don't have them. Now you may say, preacher, what do you mean by that? Well, we must die to have children. We must die out to ourselves, die out to this world, live consecrated, yielded to God in order to have spiritual children born in our churches like they should be. But if we don't die out to ourselves and we don't have children born in our churches, then we will die out spiritually. As the old time has passed on, no new ones coming along. Your church is going to die out. So we need to realize that God tells us what happened here when these mothers to be wanted children and God gave them children, but they paid a price. I contend with all my heart when any local assembly, any church is willing to pay the price for people to be saved, we're going to see somebody saved. I believe that. We'll see people coming to God. Now, number one, they saw their barren condition. In Genesis chapter 30 and verse 1, when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, Give me children or I die. She realized her barren condition. In 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 5, 
But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. Now they saw their need. They saw something must happen. They saw only God could help them to bear children. And they got out of business with God. And when we see our barren condition today and realize we need to see people walking the aisles on the Lord's day getting saved, when we need to see children born in the family of God, when we get out of business like they did, I believe with all of my heart we're going to most certainly see people saved. We'll not be concerned as a church until we see our need. We've got to see that need. If we are self-satisfied and don't see that need, then we're not going to see children born into God's family. I'm talking about spiritual children. People getting saved is what I'm referring to. We're living in the Laodicean state of the church age when so many churches are self-satisfied and they don't care whether people are saved or not. And that's wrong. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. There's nothing in the world that will take the place in God's house of children being born into God's family. There's nothing that will really stir God's people. And nothing pleases God any more than for sinners to get saved. But God's people must move the stones out of the way before Lazarus can be resurrected. God's people must get down to business before we'll see people saved in our churches. Very few people a day are being saved in our churches. You have some change in churches, joining by letter, going one church to another. But you don't see a lot of people getting saved. When we organized the Calvary Baptist Church in 1940 out here on the bypass, we never saw a barren Sunday for a solid year. We had as high as 14 people being saved on one Sunday. And every Sunday people walked the aisles for God. And that took place over a period of a year's time. And the first year we took in better than 300 members and I baptized most of them. But our people were down to business with God. They saw the need, the need of the church, the need of people being saved, need of the loved ones being saved. We planted that church out in the community and there's no reflection on the community because all about a like today. When we put that church out there, you could hardly find a rock as big as your fist before it didn't have a little blood and hair on it. They believed in fighting drinking liquor like other places in the county, and they needed a church there. And that's no reflection on people that live in the community at that time because people are just about alike everywhere. But you'll find some communities, maybe a little rougher than others, and there was a great need, and people got out of the business, and they cried to God, and people walked out every Lord's day. Now, beloved, if we're going to see people saved, we've got to get down to business like Hannah did and uh, like uh, Rachel did. Now, the adversary, number two, provoked Hannah's sower. The devil wouldn't let her rest. In 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 6, an adversary also provoked her sower for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. The devil aggravated her day after day from sun up or sun down and maybe at night when she tried to sleep and say, you're not going to have any children. Your husband's not going to continue to love you. He's going to love Lear. She's giving children uh, to her husband. You are not. And Hannah the same way when Elkanah loved her, but the devil said, no, oh no, he's not going to love you if you don't bear children. And so she got concerned about this. She was provoked by the devil. And we're not concerned about false religion, seem like anymore in the world. We need to, be, need to be provoked and stirred up about the cults that's come into our land. We're not concerned about five billion people on the face of the earth today, and most of them are on the road to hell. We don't seem to be concerned about that. We're not concerned about the growing evil in our land today like we ought to be. I've been greatly grieved since I saw, heard yesterday morning on the news about this good pastor, 29 years old, up here 
uh, beyond Monroe at Walton, Walnut Grove. Passed him a church there. 29 years old, fine, clean-cut, humble young man. Went to his church yesterday morning to get his message ready for today. And while he was there in his church study, in walked a cold-blooded murder. Pulled out a gun and robbed him and shot him three times. And left the man dead on the floor. And went and took his automobile. And they haven't arrested him yet. What are you saying preach Edwards? We are not concerned about the judicial system we have today. That stopped punishing criminals. And that man knew that they wouldn't. Chances are wouldn't do anything with him. When they caught him. Give him a little vacation somewhere. In some place they call maybe. A penitentiary and let him look at TV and play ball and play checkers, play cards, feed him good meals every day. He knew that. He knew chances are he would never have to go to the electric chair. I'm going to tell you before God today, if we would get back putting these cold-blooded murders to death, they'd stop that foolishness. I was glad the other day when they found a jury had guts enough to give old, old uh, Potts the death penalty again. Should have been put to death years ago. It's good when you have a jury that's do it, or do it, whether or not you have judges that's got guts enough to stand by it or not. But anyway, we need to get concerned about these things. I thought I'd look in the paper today and read a little something about the good pastor being killed. And I went through the paper there and I didn't see anything about it. It's too busy writing, uh, writing up these marches and things to have along that line. Didn't have time to report that a good pastor had been killed, murdered, cold blood in his study. Are we concerned about these things? I am. I'm concerned about them. It stirs me up. And we need to be. We need to be concerned about the going evil in our land. We need to be concerned about more than 85 deaths every minute and most of them going to hell. When we get concerned about these things, then we get on to business. Number three, she began to weep over her barren condition. The Bible said Hannah went to the temple of God and she got down on her knees and began to weep at the altar and she shed tears. Old Eli the priest thought she was drunk, but she wasn't drunk. She was praying. She was talking to God. Tears running down her cheeks. She was crying because she had no son, no children by her husband. Her heart was broken. And she's praying to God, God, give me children. I want to bear my husband a son. In Psalms 126 and verse 6, the Bible said, He that goeth forth weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. The Bible said if we'll weep, if we're willing to weep over sinners, we can win some to God. That's what he tells us. Would to God we had more tears shed. I'm talking about real, genuine tears shed today over lost sinners. I'm not talking about little pumped up crocodile tears. I'm talking about genuine tears from the heart over lost sinners. Don't have much of it today. There was a meeting one time in a little country church. It was as cold as an iceberg. The visiting preacher could hardly preach, almost choked to death because of the coldness. One good old deacon in that church loved God from depths of his soul. He said, we're not going to have a meeting here unless we can get a hold of God. He went down in the field and down beside of a terse and began to pray. He said, God, we're trying to have a meeting in the little meeting house up here, but you're not there. Lord, won't you come and be with us? And whenever they came back to the service that night, he was still praying. The next morning when they came back for the morning service, he was still crying to God. God, we're trying to have a meeting up here at the little meeting house, and you're not up there. Lord, won't you come and be with us? That man stayed on his knees for many, many hours. Finally, God heard, and God came, and God met with him in the little church house, and they had a real, genuine meeting. Why? Because one deacon shed tears with a broken heart, cried to God that God might come and be with them there in the meeting. We need to realize that we must weep if we're going to find souls for God and get souls to God. Number four, she prayed and fasted. In verses 7 and 10 there in 1 Samuel, you find that she prayed and she fasted. She wouldn't eat. She kept on praying. Old John Knox said, give me Scotland or I die. 
He said, God, it can't live if you don't give me Scotland. I want Scotland for God. And John Knox stayed on his knees crying unto God gave him Scotland. And the Queen of England said she feared the prayers of John Knox more than she feared the army of England. Oh, listen to me. A man on his knees can move things for God. There must be travailing in prayer. In Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 8, For as soon as Zion travails, she brought forth children. As soon as Zion travail, she brought forth children. Mothers know when they birth children in the world, there comes a time of travailing or birth pains. They know that. And then after the travail, after the birth pains, comes a newborn son, a newborn daughter. God said when we're willing to travail, get down to business in agony, shed tears, God said there'll be somebody saved. There'll be some children born. There's always a price to pay in childbearing. Now you can go out here and buy your little dog, get your little cat, a parakeet or, or some kind of little animal, a fowl, and, and, uh, and take that in your home, and I'm not uh, condemning that. But you can do that without any travail. You don't have travail. You don't have to go through birth pains in order to buy a little puppy dog and bring it into your home. You don't go through birth pains in buying a cat and taking the cat or a parakeet or whatever in your home, no birth pains there. But if you're going to have children in your home, you're going to have some birth pains. Children come only through travail and birth pains. And mothers know if they bear children, they got to go through that. And when that is through, the child is there. Beloved, we're not going to see people saved People getting right with God until we begin to travail in prayer and some birth pains taking place and then children can be born. Yonder in South Carolina many years ago, one of the greatest preacher in the South, Dr. Harold E. Seidler, he was pastor of a little church over there in Pelham. That thing was as dead as four o'clock in the morning. They went month in and month out, year in and year out, never baptized anybody. And he said to his people, he said, we got to get something done. Meet me down in the cow pasture. There's a cow pasture nearby. They went down in the cow pasture and they prayed. And they stayed in the cow pasture. They kept praying. They wouldn't leave the cow pasture. They kept on praying. Kept on agonizing. Begin to travail in prayer. Begin to weep and cry that God would do something for them there in the little church at Pelham. They went back. And souls began to come to God. People got saved. Revival broke out. People began to praise God, shout the victory, go out after sinners. And as a result of that, the, the Tabernacle Baptist Church in Greenville today came out of that uh, movement of what happened there in Pelham. One of the greatest independent missionary Baptist churches in the South or in the United States. The Tabernacle Baptist Church in the city of Greenville, South Carolina. I believe it's operated and run scripturally more so than most any other church I know anything about. All of it came because of agonizing and praying in the cow pasture in Pelham, South Carolina. That's willing to pay the price. Number five, she was willing to make a vow unto God. She said, I'm going to make a vow to God. It, it don't hurt to make a vow to God. Just be sure you keep that vow. In verse 11, she bowed about and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou indeed look on the flicks of thy handmaid and remember me and not forget thy handmaid, will give unto thy handmaid a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. What did Hannah say to God? She was crying. She said, Lord, if you'll give me a child, if you'll just give me a child, if you'll just give me a, a little boy, she said, the Lord, I'll give him back to you. He'll be yours. I'll promise you that, Lord. I'll promise you that uh, I'll give him to you. There'll be no razor to come upon his head. He'll be a Nazarite unto thee. I'll give him back to you, Lord. He'll be yours. He'll be yours, God, if you'll just give me that boy. Number six, she asked for a man-child in verse 11. Give unto thy handmaid a man-child. Now, don't misunderstand me. We thank God today for all of our good women. 
Were it not for our good women today, our churches would be in sad shape, I guarantee you. I've run meetings in churches over the years where you wouldn't have over three or four men in the church and maybe you'd have a, a dozen or two women carrying on for God. We thank God for the good men. I'm talking about men that are be used of God. And we need men today. We thank God for our women. Back in the days of Jesus, it was the women that ministered to him there in time of need. And we praise God for our good women. But not only do we need them, but we need some men today. We, we need some real fathers today. We need some men today that's strong, that will serve God, that stand up for something and be counted. She said, God, give me a man child. She didn't say, now, Lord, I want you to give me a little babe. Doesn't matter what it is, just so you give me a baby. No, no. No, no. She said, God, I want a man child. I want a male. God, I want a boy. God, give me a man child. Now, in those days, the little boys that came along was appreciated seemingly more than little girls from this viewpoint because they needed men to help make a living, to till the, the, the farms, to take care of the cattle, and to fight the wars. They couldn't fight battles in those days unless they had men. And men were very important. The little girls were precious when they were born, but it was the men that they counted on. And they always looked forward to a son being born in the home because he could go out in time of war and defend the home. He could go out and work among the cattle and, and the vineyards and so forth and show the responsibility. And she said, Lord, I want you to give me a man-child. Give me a man-child. I, I, I want a man-child. And what we need in our church today are some real men that's got strong shoulders that cover the ground they stand on, that believe in God and believe in prayer, that's going to say to their household, for me and my house, we're going to serve God. Oh, listen to me. I was talking to a dear brother the other day, and he said, Brother Edwards, the thing that bothers me when I come to church on Sunday I look across the street and I see little children playing out there that's never darkened the door of the house of God anywhere. Their parents never take them to Sunday school, never take them to church. They play out there on the Lord's day. They don't know what it is to go to the house of God. I'm going to tell you something today. Some of you out there in the radio listen to us right now. You listen to me. Let me have your ears a minute now and you listen to this Baptist preacher. You're sitting out there in your home right now, and you're the head of your house. And there are your little children running around there in the house, and you never carry them to church. You never say to your wife, we're going to church today. You never try to take a, a leadership in spiritual things, and you just sit there like a knot on a log, a wooden Indian, and you go and let your youngins grow up without God, maybe to enter into uh, all kind of crimes such as doping, liquor, beer, and wine, and and uh, get out in, in criminal acts because you never care them the house of God. Do you think God's going to let you get by with that? Now you listen to me. You think God's going to let you get by with you letting your wife and youngins go to hell when you could do something about it? No, you're the head of your house and God's going to hold you responsible and God's looking down the gun barrel at you men and God's going to hold you responsible for your home as certain as you listen to the sound of my voice. We need some men today to get up on Sunday and say, Wife, get ready. Let's get the youngins ready. We go into the house of God today. we got to die one of these days. And I don't want my children to go to hell. And I don't want you to go to hell, wife. And we go get right with God. And we go in the house of God. That's the kind of men we need today. We need men with backbone to stand up and say with Joshua of old, For me and my house, we'll serve God. Like God said about Abraham, I'm not going to keep anything from him because he's going to command his household after him. God expects you men to do it. We need some men today in our country. We need some men today in our church. She said, give me a man child. And of course, they, God gave her that child, and she named him Samuel. The name Samuel means ask of God. Now later on, of course, God, Rachel had a son and named him Joseph. One of the greatest men ever walked in shoe leather. Joseph and Daniel, two men in the Bible outstanding. You'd never find any fault against or any sin recorded against those men. 
Of course, they were sinners, but no sin recorded against them. What a great man. There we find that Rachel said, give me a son, Jacob. If you don't, I'm going to die. Jacob said, I'm not God. No doubt she began to look to God and said, God, give me a son. I'm going to die. Just go ahead and take my life. God said, I'm going to give you a son. While well, the greatest that ever lived, God gave it Joseph. Then we find that Hannah said, oh, God, I want a son. I want a son. God gave us Samuel, the first of the prophets. And the name Samuel means answer to prayer or ask of God. Ask of God is what Samuel means. And every time anybody saw Samuel, they said, there goes an answer to prayer. There goes a man that came because a woman prayed. That man is an answer to prayer. Samuel was a great prophet of God. And he came in answer to prayer. And she said, I'm going to give him back to you, Lord. Verses 11, 27, 20. I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. For this child I pray, the Lord hath given me my petitions to ask of him. Therefore, so I've led him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he should be lent to the Lord. She said, this boy is dedicated to God. And he'll be dedicated to God as long as I live. And Hannah rejoiced because of it. In 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 1, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horns exult in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. And she's praising God and shouting the victory because God gave her a son and they named him Samuel. What sweet words. Listen to these words that came out of the mouth of Samuel in his days when he was a prophet in Israel. First Samuel chapter 12, verses 23 and 24. Moreover, as for me, God forbid I should sin against the Lord and cease to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord, serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things he has done for you. Who prayed that? Samuel, the little boy. The man, the little boy that became the prophet, prayed that prayer while the sweetest in the word of God. Dear people, listen, these women received their sons because they got out of business. And I contend when God's people really get out to business, then God's going to do something. Some of you may have heard me tell about Sam the barber. There's a man named Sam. He was a barber in this village. Everybody knew him. All the men went there and got their hair cut. Everybody knew Sam, but Sam was a sinner. One day Sam went out fishing, and he fell out of the boat. Couldn't get back in, and he drowned. And for several days, they searched for Sam. They kept on searching. They, they searched and searched until they finally found Sam's body after several days. They brought it in for the funeral, placed it down before the preacher. You know what the preacher said? Preacher said, Sam, if the people in this town had been as concerned about your soul as they were your body after you drowned, Sam, you wouldn't be in hell today. God help us realize unless God's people are concerned, people are going to hell. People are not just going to automatically get saved. Somebody's going to have to win them to God. Somebody's got to tell them about Christ. Somebody must win them to Jesus or they're going to hell. Are we willing to pay the price? Hannah did. Rachel did. And God came to the rescue. Let's stand our feet. Father in heaven, I pray today that you'll take the message and use it. Stir our hearts, dear Lord. We're all guilty of not being concerned about sinners as we should be. God, help us to be more concerned. Lord, we like to hear the cry of a newborn babe in the house of God. We want to see people saved. We want to see the babes in Christ fed and helped and strengthened. We want your children fed. But God, help us to be burdened and travail for these without Christ. Have we in this invitation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. David's going to play for us. Now you listen to me. Listen closely. If you're in this building, you're not saved. You want to get saved, if you'll come down here, we'll help you to God. If you're in this building and you once knew the Lord and you've broken fellowship with God and you're not happy, if you'll come down here, we'll, we'll help you back to God.
And then if you're here and you want to join this church, you come down here, we'll take that in consideration. If there's any other reason that you want to come, you come, please. While she plays. Message God laid on my heart, up to you.